Hello and welcome to Snyder's Return, a tabletop roleplay podcast. My guest today breaks news, breaks bread, breaks hearts and minds, all within the realms of fantasy, fiction and fandoms. Not to press the issue too hard, but spend a short amount of time with their interviews or articles and you'll come away informed, excited, educated and entertained. From slaying dragons to breaking Dungeons and Dragons, my guest is hot off the press, word on the street, and a beacon in the dark. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome game writer, TTRPG enthusiast, and journalist for io9 and Gizmodo, Linda Kadega. Linda, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. What an introduction that was. That was really incredible. Man, I feel I feel very hyped up. That's that was really great. Well, this <laughs> is all your, well, this is all your work spun, da- spun back to you. So it's it's a privilege to have you on the show. Uh, before we get to some of the things I've alluded to there in the introduction, Linda, how did you get into tabletop role playing games, please? Yeah, so it all started, I think, when I was ten or eleven. I was young, and I discovered role playing game forums online. So it was just like you go on on a forum and like you create a character, and then you just do like text-based role playing with other people and that was really how I was introduced to like role playing games in general um and then I found Dungeons and Dragons sort of in college and that's kind of when I started actually playing games with dice and not just you know going online with friends and making up silly little stories oh wow so once you picked up Dungeons and Dragons as a hobby as a hobby and sort of started rolling dice where did your journey go from there and and how has how have you sustained yourself with the hobby since that initial sort of start point so when i first started playing dungeons dragons it was right around the time that 5e was coming out um so it it was still a time where there was like a lot of dude bros in the hobby uh, and it wasn't really that welcoming for me as like mm-hmm. a femme presenting non-binary person. Uh, so I sort of like picked it up and put it down over the years and sort of always preferred like role playing with with uh, my friends online um, and stuff like that. And then a couple a couple years after that, I found indie games and I found the the sort of side of tabletop role playing games that um are far less crunchy and far more experimental and focused. And I just never realized that there, there was a, a whole different side of the, you know, paper and dice games out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I did, it was sort of all over for me because I loved <laughs> it so much. And it was like, oh, I can take this, like, I can take this out and, like, bring it to a table and, like, play with other friends. And I just really dove in deep into the indie tabletop role-playing game scene and kind of never left so that's really how i've sustained myself with the hobby and like focused on the the innovative art that's coming out from a lot of different small creators and is really what i still really love to focus on even now as i am uh hot on the heels of the dragon beat Mm. So with respect to the, the indie games you, you found at the start and have maybe influenced the way you have carried forward, and we'll get to your, your game writing uh, in a little bit, what were the indie games you found first and which of, you, which of them have really stuck with you as a, either a memorable experience or just a, a great system that you'd love to sort of take advantage of in the future? So I think it was powered by the Apocalypse Systems. I don't remember if it was Apocalypse World or Dungeon World or something along those lines, but it was one of the early powered by the Apocalypse Systems. It might have even been Monster of the Week that Mm. really, you know, sparked sparked something in my brain where I was like, this is incredible. Um, So I think that was probably, those were probably some of the first ones. I still love Monster of the Week, and I really love the Powered by the Apocalypse game Masks Mm. uh, by Brendan Conway out of Magpie Games. There's just something about like those two games in particular, I think are really, really good at what they do. Yeah. And I think Powered by the Apocalypse games are incredibly valuable for like genre emulation and once you sort of get a niche with your game and like, you know, you stick to something like for masses, obviously like teenage superheroes for monster of the week, it's monster of the week 
uh, television shows like Supernatural and X-Files, then once you sort of like hone in on the kind of genre you want to emulate, Powered by the Apocalypse really facilitates creating a game that does that and does it really, really well. Mm. And one of the one of the recent Powered by the Apocalypse games that I really love uh, is called Interstitial, Our Hearts Intertwined. And it's a Kingdom Hearts Powered by the Apocalypse game where oh, it's wow. basically just like, yeah, and it's basically just like uh, it's a game for writing a bunch of like crossover fan fiction. So in the in this one AP that I listened to, it has like Chris Angel and also like uh, someone from Final Fantasy and mm. then someone from like the Goofy movie. And they're all like this adventuring team that go off on adventures and it's just really fun and allows people to kind of be goofy and gonzo but also stresses the kind of kingdom hearts vibe of like friendship love darkness i love it so well uh, i would say powered by the apocalypse yeah well feel free to name drop that that actual play uh we love supporting other other shows here at snyder's return so if you, oh, if you... it's it's interstitial. Our hearts intertwined. It's like the actual play that supported the the game, uh, Kickstarter, and like is is run by gotcha. the GM, and the GM is the author of the the game as well. All right, so, all right, yeah, They're perfect. I love that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Can't argue with that. So outside of of that particular um, Power by the Apocalypse game and that actual play. What other games have sort of guided your hand through to to where you are now as a TTRPG enth- player, enthusiast, and supporter? Yeah, I think another good game is the Trophy Dark system um, by The Gauntlet. It's It was written by Jesse Ross and published by The Gauntlet. Um, but that game is just like short, sweet, effective really leads into the kind of play to lose horror that I really enjoy where it's just like no you are gonna like make a character and you are going to see them through until they destroy themselves (laughs) Um, so sort of recognizing that like you don't have to be precious about the kind of characters you make and you don't have to be um, protective of your characters in the game I think that was a really really great lesson and then also I think from Trophy Dark they when they first published that game they also published alongside it a how to write an incursion for trophy dark and sort of getting that step by step here's how you write Mm. your own version of this game i think was really informative and very clever and probably the first time that i'd ever seen oh someone like wants me to write something for this game i'm gonna do that um and that's just because it's you know indie indie games you know yeah. they're fast and loose it's a wild wild west out there <laughs> uh, but it's i think that 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 game in particular has has a very strong uh place on my design sensibilities as well well it says in an article you read recently that you wrote recently that i read even more recently uh that you use that as your basis for when you started uh game writing um, yes so where has that journey taken you so I mostly just like putter around. I write supplements here and there. I write some, I wrote some small games. Um, I really enjoy it. It's something that it's something I do in my spare time, which is increasingly less and less <laughs> nowadays. I don't even know the meaning anymore. Um, but I want to do more games writing and I have a couple things kind of in my email inbox that I need to respond to that are uh, game design in game writing questions so hopefully i'll be able to give myself like a little bit more structure and some more discipline and i'm just like no linda you can't spend three hours replaying bioshock you have to spend at least one hour writing (laughs) i guess (laughs) um so hopefully i'll be able to you know give myself a little bit more discipline and uh write the games that i want to write because there's some really cool ones i i have uh floating around google drives and in emails Mm, i'm sure i'm sure so where did uh where did your ttrpg and journalism when did they intersect and sort of become your core employment i guess yeah 
Good question. I always wanted to be a writer and I've been pursuing writing professionally for the past 10 years or so. Mm. And it's really only in the past four or five years that I've had that I've made any money off of writing about tabletop role playing games and only in the past year or so that it's been my full time job. So it's been about four, four or five ish years of, you know, doing freelance pitches and like writing for other outlets or, you know, spending most of my time writing about advertisements for my full time job and then freelancing <laughs> on the side. Mm. So it's just one of those things where it's like, I, I always knew that I wanted to write and I always knew I wanted to write about the stuff that I really enjoyed doing. Um, because anything else was just not very satisfying for me. And I'm just like, I, I know that I'll do a better job at any job that I do if I actually love the work that I'm doing and love the, uh, the subject matter. Yeah. So it was just sort of like, you know, 10, 10, five to 10 years of sort of making lateral moves and like slowly moving into a space like at io9 where I can write about the stuff that I really, really love which is science fiction, fantasy, tabletop role-playing games, and, you know, whatever, more or less whatever I want, like whatever interests me. There's some limits, like here's here's a limit that I'm going to, I'm going to break down. I'm going, like, if my editor is listening to this, I'm sorry, I'm coming for you. <laughs> he does not want us to cover Magic Mike, even though there's a third, there's a fourth movie coming out. That seems and like I'm a crime. Like, it seems like I'm like magic is right in the name. <laughs> <laughs> like it's right there. It, this writes itself. So hopefully I'll be able to like uh sneak that one in. <laughs> we'll see if it works. But I'm just like magic is right in the name. If that's not science fiction and fantasy, I don't I don't know what is. <laughs> um, it's certainly somebody's fantasy. So Exactly. That's what I'm saying. There you go. So uh, we've mentioned io9 and we've mentioned your good self and, and this sort of long uh <laughs> sideways maneuvers through to get to where you are so now you are yeah. where you are where can yeah. we find you uh you can find me being weird online at twitter which is just at l-i-n-c-o-d-e-g-a um and you can follow me on io9 which is a vertical of gizmodo uh, and that's where like all my writing is right now, uh, just on io9. And also I promote uh, my writing, like the, the writing that I'm proud of on Twitter. So you can pretty frequently find my articles there as well. All right. Well, I will make sure links uh, to you, io9, uh, Gizmodo, and all the other things we're going to mention, including the, the actual play you mentioned earlier, uh, down in the description below. So please scroll down, support Linda, and um, what the fantastic work you do bringing us news and information. Uh, you mentioned there sci-fi, fantasy, TTRPGs, films. What has been your favorite of each of those genres in the last, I don't know, let's, let's go with your five-year sort of reign sort of favorite game yeah. that, that you've either written about or you've watched but maybe not been able to write about magic might doesn't count i'm afraid oh you and my editor ridiculous <laughs> um that i haven't been able to write about that's really hard because i think like a lot of really great television and films have come out in the past couple of years uh hmm. what have been your favorites i'm not going to try and overcomplicate the question yeah that's well, uh, do you mind if I talk about the stuff I have written about over the Absolutely. past year? Absolutely, yes, please. Okay, okay, okay. I'll talk about like some of my favorites of the past year, um, because that's much easier for me because it's like in in my little Rolodex. Yeah. Uh, I just I know this is a an audio medium, but I just pretended like my head was a Rolodex and like spun my ear around. You guys <laughs> missed it. Uh, I really loved for films everything everywhere all at once just an incredible film and i i obsessed over that film i got to talk to the to the directors i got to talk to stephanie shu uh i loved that film so much it really meant a lot to me mm. um on a lot on a number of levels and i think i i produced a really incredible interview um with the with the daniels where they were talking about the the structure of the film and i was able to format the interview to reflect the structure of the of the film 
uh, and I'm really, I'm really proud of that. <laughs> I'm really yeah. proud of that interview. Might be so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also for for television, I really loved Interview with the Vampire. Um, I thought it was very, it was an incredibly well done contemporary retelling. It was hilarious and funny and dramatic and intense and sexy. And it really, I was expecting something much cheesier and pulpier like kind of on the vein of like oh supernatural like i love Mm. it but it's also just like supernatural man (laughs) what are you gonna do but they amc and the whole cast and crew delivered this really elegant prestige drama somehow and i'm just Mm. like how did you how did you pull this off it was it was just incredible a really really wonderful um wonderful film a wonderful piece of television for Mm. games gosh there's so many that came out um games that came out last year i really really like uh into the odd and i've said that before i wrote a I wrote a review of into the odd um where it's just sort of like old school role playing just like straight up dungeon delving but also like very clever about its satire Mm. and leaves a lot of open space i think into the odd was probably one of my favorites from last year and i don't remember when orbital blues came out if that was last year or the year before but i'm re- i'm in an orbital blues game right now and i really am am loving it my gm is so good he's so good and i'm playing with like him his wife and like another friend and it's just like it's, it's really really wonderful it's sad space cowboys basically mm. yeah yeah no into the yeah. out is is great um i managed to in- interview the the creator of, of, of that game and uh, the artwork in the book and the the dungeon delving and hex court it's all very cleverly done the artwork is mm-hmm. fantastic uh, if you yeah happen to pick up a copy of it yeah i totally agree oh a, a book that came out last year monster care squad an incredible book a uh, beautiful like really nails this kind of like pokemon meets final fantasy vibe really really love it um another game that i've played multiple times over the past year is apollo 47 by tim hutchings all right i've not played that it's so simple to play it's basically like a chatter a space chatter game the the concept is you are the 47th mission to the moon and it's kind of this sort of like retro futurism where it's like oh yeah like you're definitely on a mission to the moon but it's like really boring actually (laughs) And every time something interesting happens, like you end the scene. So it's just like nonstop radio chatter. And it's really, I don't know what it is about it that makes it like so fun, but it's incredibly fun. And I was lucky enough to receive a review copy of the thousand page NASA manual that the game comes with. So basically like the game is like six pages at the front of this like thousand page NASA manual that's like here's how to repair a rover and like here's what the space suits look like and you can literally just like flip to any page and start like bullshitting <laughs> and that's the whole game is to nice. just like have non-stop bullshit love it's, it uh it can be very very fun yeah no it sounds it it sounds it um I guess computer game would be the last category I guess Ooh, I don't really play. I don't play a lot of video games, honestly. Um, I've been playing Hades basically nonstop since it mm. came out. Uh, but I know that's, you know, two or three or four years old at this point. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't have a lot of time for video games, so I don't play a lot of them. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, oh, I read a lot of books. I do read a lot of books. What are some good books from last year? Hmm. I don't know. I can't think of any. I read a lot of them. Uh, one of the ones that I read last year, I think, was The Thousand Eyes, which was a, a sequel to, which was the AK, AK Larkwood, and it was a sequel to her first book, which on The Unspoken Name was the first book. So the sequel came out, and I really, really vibed with the sequel. Mm. Really loved it um it was just a it's very it's very epic fantasy uh and it's sort of like this sort of science fantasy and like an orc girl assassin is like the main character and there's also like a horrible goddess and like a terrible like magician priestess and like a really really like disaster bisexual (laughs) wizard and then also like uh 
a young man who's like accidentally becomes a dad and he's just like what do i do with this small child and the small child is like i wish for murder <laughs> the, the, like the like 40 year old repressed gay man is just like ah <laughs> it's, it's really very funny i thought it was just like a really great ending to that series hmm. oh, it sounds sounds good uh yeah. so <laughs> Sorry, I just rambled no, for like no, 10 not, minutes on like all the all. media I've consumed. <laughs> well, because you you write about various media, you know, your your opinion and, and your uh, criticisms and your likes and dislikes, uh, you know, they carry weight. Your 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 word in both verbal and, and print have um, sort of substance to them. Um, so, you know, you have to respect yeah. the, the opinions and and the knowledge which you have. Uh, and you have you mentioned um, when we were chatting there about films, mm-hmm. you have conducted some incredible interviews with very high profile people in the past and and more recently. So, what's it like being put yeah. in front of and across from these icons and and sort of trendsetters and leaders in their field of? the topics you've discussed with them. I, I won't cherry pick. I'll, I'll let you pick out the ones yeah. that you've enjoyed the most. Yeah. It's one of those things where I'm very lucky that I don't really get starstruck. I'm very grateful that that has kind of been banished from my system. Um, but I think it's, it's really cool. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I have a really, <laughs> there are some like really, really cool parts to my job that I really appreciate. And that I really, um, I don't take for granted. I don't, I don't necessarily think that my job is, would be bad if I didn't get to do some of the cool interviews I got to do. But I think that the fact that I do is like really fun for me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that a big example is I, I got to do like a really long, like 30 minute sit down interview with uh, Matt Mercer and Marcia Ray recently, which was really, really fun for me because I've never met them and I don't really uh, watch critical roles so I didn't really know who they were but they were delightful people they were very very nice and that was really fun um at the same time when I was trying to be like I know you know something <laughs> that I know and I know that you know that I know something and we both know that we know things so how much are you going to tell me right now and how much are you just not going to tell me even though I know yeah and you know I know <laughs> <laughs> so, so stuff like that's really fun um, I did an interview with Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba last year mm. for 3000 years of longing. That was really delightful because they loved my questions and also like complimented my hair. So <laughs> it's just, it was just like, you know, a double whammy where I'm just like, Oh no, <laughs> I've peaked. <laughs> this is it for me. Peak too soon. <laughs> I really did peak peak way too soon with that one um but that was a really fun interview they were just we only got like six or seven minutes together maybe even five but they Mm. were you know very professional but also very like yeah that is a really great question and then like went on for like four minutes and i'm just like mr elba i have other questions (laughs) (laughs) it's okay um yeah and then every now and then i get to meet people in person which is really cool i i got to meet alan cumming I got to meet Tyler Posey, which was really fun because we were like basically the same age and we were just like really vibing <laughs> like in our interview because we were just like joking around and being really silly. And I think that he sometimes doesn't get to do a lot of those interviews. So he's right. just like, this was really fun. I'm just like, it was really fun, right? I'm really fun. <laughs> you like me a lot, right? So yeah, there's a lot of those interviews that I really am very, very appreciative of. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's just really nice. I've I've interviewed Rahul Kohli twice, which was really which is really fun. Mm-hmm. He's a very nice dude and very nerdy, and I'm excited for him to continue to be nerdy. Um, yeah, I really like I really like doing those sorts of interviews, and I really like interviewing the showrunners and the cast and the creators and the writers. Um, there are sometimes overlooked in favor of the the sort of movie stars that are attached to any given project so when i really like something i tend to go write for the writers and be like so 
you want to do an interview? You want to <laughs> talk to me? So I'm really lucky that I've been able to, I've been given access to a lot of the creators that way, which mm. is really, really nice. Yeah. And the, and then the uh, the interview with a vampire uh, television show, I became like a very loud and active participant in the fandom for that. And the do it, I did a ton of interviews for it, and I did a ton of writing on it just in general. Um, and I was really grateful that I got so much access because of that. I basically interviewed every single cast member, some of them twice. Um, and I interviewed, and I interviewed like writers and I interviewed a couple of the cast members in person. Um, so it was just really nice. It was really cool to be like a fan of something and also know like, oh yeah, like if I talk to a cast member, they're going to recognize me. They're going to like remember me. And I'm just like, "Hmm, feels good. (laughs) I'm very nerdy and I'm very excited. (laughs) It's all good stuff. All good stuff. And <laughs> some something that has brought you uh more more eyes from the, the TTRPG sphere was was breaking the whole D and D OGL kerfuffle. I, I not debacle. I'm I mean you've have far better words for it than, than I, but uh no, so I what think was kerfuffle's it? good. It's, yeah. So what was kerfuffle. it like? getting on in on that first and and seeing how that has evolved in days weeks months and to where we are now and going into the future yeah so i was one of the one of the first people to receive the ogl 1.1 from a source and um i believe that i was the first outlet to report on it um and it's been kind of wild to see not only the response from the TTRPG community, but just the interest outside of it, it has really breached containment in a big way. I think once, once you know, they invite people on NPR to talk about a copyright license, mm. then you know that like some something's weird, something's gone very, very wrong for for Wizards of the Coast. Um, so I think it's it's been really incredible. It's been kind of mind blowing. Um, I'm very lucky that I. I guess I'm very grateful that I was the one to break it because obviously it's very good for me and like my career personally. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that there are, there are not a lot of outlets that would have been able to understand and deliver the kind of coverage that io9 was able to deliver. I think that there are, I think Polygon could have done it. I think Dicebreaker could have done it. I think that maybe CBRcomicbook.com could have done it, but even then that's you know a handful of outlets i don't know if you know i don't know if like washington post would have cared i don't know if the times would have cared like i just don't know if those sort of big legacy outlets would have understood what what the ogl was and like how, why it was so important and i don't think any i don't think any outlets other than sort of like the nerdy focus outlets maybe vice would have would have known what to do with it maybe, maybe. But I think that there there's just like not a lot of places out there that would have allowed their journalists or their reporters to sort of pursue, to like immediately pursue the story and like keep up with it. Hmm. Um, so I'm very grateful it came to me. I'm very grateful I work at io9 and it just sort of happened to be a, a story that, that took off. And that got a lot of attention, I think, for a lot of reasons, um, besides the fact that, like, I was the first, this, it was the first, like, traditional outlet to report on it. I think it was the fact that it was confirming a lot of fears that had been brewing for, like, two to three months. And it was also kind of this weird culmination of a lot of issues that people had with Wizards of the Coast. And sort of, this was sort of, like, the big camel that broke people, the... The, the big camel i mean it was <laughs> a big, big camel on the straw, straw that broke the camel's yeah, yeah. Back. <laughs> the straw that broke the camel's back um more so than it was just like this sort of meteorite that like, came out of nowhere and mm. blew everything up so yeah um it's been really wild to watch and i'm really grateful that i was able to report on it and that i'm still able to to sort of pursue the story because my editors have recognized how important it is and they're just like go forth 
right pursue i'm just like hell yeah well the the story continues on its own momentum but it, it has also spiraled out or offshoots into the other games publishers and indie games we we've mentioned before so what has it been like sort of seeing other game systems getting the the recognition or at least getting mentioned now uh alongside where this sort of monolith titan uh, however you choose to describe what wizards is um has faltered in its sort of steps yeah i'm i think that's the best thing to sort of come out of this whole kerfuffle is that other systems are getting a chance to show up and show off and get new players and that the scene is diversifying because really you know back in the back in the 90s even back in like the the early 2000s no one just played Dungeons and Dragons like they do now it really was 5e that kind of vaulted it was like a combination of like 5e Taz Critical Role and like Stranger Things that solidified Dungeons and Dragons as kind of like the role playing game and so mm. because it the the scene has always been diverse but it has never really had such a huge cultural impact as it has now um and Dungeons and Dragons was just there to sort of take advantage of that cultural currency in a big way so I'm really grateful that people are realizing and recognizing and seeing other games and are also curious about other games and are also willing to branch out into other games Mm. i think that that's probably the best thing that could happen out of this is that it's not necessarily that like wizards goes under like dungeons dragons stops or anything like that it's that people explore new ways to make stories with your friends and i think new games and new systems are like the perfect way to do that nice so you have mentioned science fiction. We've mentioned TTRPGs. You've mentioned playing Orbital Blues. What other science fiction TTRPGs do you enjoy playing? Or would you recommend? Or would you like Ooh. to play? Since these sort Ooh. of tick are several of your sort of boxes, as it were. Sure. Um, I'm really interested in playing the uh, Blade Runner RPG from yep. Free League. Yep. Uh, my only reservation is that you have to play a cop. <laughs> like, the whole game is centered around being, like, a replicant cop. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> a choice, but okay. Um, There is Cyborg, there is Balikbion, there's... What other good, good sci-fi? The Sprawl is a really excellent, like, sci-fi um, set, like, dystopia gosh what is what is the word for the sci-fi dy- cyberpunk yeah okay. that's the word for the game <laughs> that's the word from the genre that was just totally escaping me uh the sprawl is really really great there's a lot of really good games out there inspired by star wars i know that there's uh galactic 2e that i really want to play okay. which is a belonging outside belonging game by riley rathal what other good sci-fi game oh my gosh so there's uh lost in space which is another it's not a free league game but it's under their like free league banner public like publishing house yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, mothership a wonderful game i really really dig the d100 system and the panic engine i think it's really clever yeah there's there's a lot of games out there that are sci-fi that like either want to play or like have played uh i think it's really fun I love games. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I uh, love games. If you haven't had the chance, uh, I would recommend Alien, also by Free League, and yes, Death in I Space, also under the Free League publishing house banner. Actually, yeah, I think Death in Space was the one that I was I was talking about. Where when I I think I might have said Lost in Space, but Death in Space, the one with like the black cover and That's like right, kind of the yeah. swirly. Yes, that one is it's very good. Beautiful book as well. Oh, it's Beautiful. incredible. Oh, Lancer. Yep. How can I forget Lancer? I love a mech. I love anything that is like sad mechs. So Lancer's definitely way up there. Uh, um, yeah, so that's by Massive Press. But you also recommended another article that you wrote that I've read recently. Uh, I've got it written here. Apocalypse Frame. 
Ooh, yes. Apocalypse Frame is like a brand new uh, mech game. It's like a rebellion anti-capitalist game where you're playing uh, basically like rebels fighting against like giant corps and you have like big mechs. That's a game I have not played, but I would love to play. Mm. No. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we've, we've covered games you would like to play, games you have played, mm-hmm. games mm-hmm. you've written about, games... Mm-hmm. And games and games and games. Um, mm-hmm. You said you don't get much spare time. You're playing an Orbital Blues game. You enjoy a couple of actual play podcasts and a few other things. Yeah. Do you do much else for your limited spare time? You've worked all this time to get time, and now you have very limited time. To, what What do you I do know. with your spare time? What do I do with my spare time? Um, I spend a lot of time with my friends. Frankly, I know that's a really boring answer, but we do a lot of potlucks. We do movie dinners. We do uh all a lot of my friends are artists so they do like art galleries and we like you know we turn art galleries openings into dance parties hmm. um so hanging out with my friends is really great because we all live there's like six or seven of us and we all live within like a mile or two of each other um which i think is kind of rare i don't live in new york city i live in kind of like a small town kind of like north of new york city the fact that it's just like there's four or five houses of like friends <laughs> um is pretty wonderful uh i really like hiking i go hiking with my dog a lot there's a lot of mountains up here again i live north of new york city so it's the hudson valley mountains Mm. everywhere so i really love mountains my my little dog is like having a little dream of people i hike with my little dog What's, Um, what's your dog's name zigzag i mean okay so her government name is zagreus (laughs) Her government name is Zagreus, but I call her Zigzag. <laughs> that is amazing. She's I love really her. great. Yeah. <laughs> People are like, government name, is she selling drugs? And I'm like, no, <laughs> she just gets in trouble. <laughs> what can I say? Um, I also am a competitive uh, sailor. Okay. On, in the summertime. So that's really fun. I'm a good, I'm a good sailor. I promise. <laughs> uh, what else do I do in my spare time? I write. I do a lot of writing. I've written a couple novels and a bunch of short stories and games. So outside of Twitter, then, can we find these novels uh, anywhere else, these short stories? So the novel, um, I currently have a literary agent, and my novel is being shopped around to editors. Oh, nice. So fingers crossed, you know, in a year or two, we'll be able to see that on shelves. Um but for now, the novels are, you know, in in, in the hands of my agent, okay. who is doing doing her best to get those sold. Uh, my short stories are kind of older, but I have one coming out in Uncharted magazine in March that I need to like check up on. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, got paid, accepted, the whole shebang. So we'll see. We'll see if that if that does end up coming out because like schedules change for short short mags. Hmm. um yeah those are that's those, that's like the most recent stuff everything else is kind of kind of older like four or five years old um but i have an itch.io page for my games if you want to check those out there are a lot of like really small games most of them are free or pay what you want so again it's i'm lucky that it's just a hobby and hmm. i don't necessarily uh, need to make money on those games for any reason at all. Some of them are paid, where I'm just like, I worked really hard on this. Fair enough. I deserve, well, I mean, I, I deserve two dollars. I mean, that's fair. So if you want to support Linda on her hobby, playing our hobby, which is all of our hobby, yeah, that was a sentence, uh, then scroll down, follow the link. I will make sure there's a link to your itch.io page, along with your Twitter, Instagram, because I found you on there. Uh, Sick. And uh, io9, uh, Gizmodo, and uh, any other out, uh, actual plays you want to, to mention? Sure. I mean, I'm I'm pretty basic. I don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of time. I, so I'm <laughs> so I'm learning. So I'm learning. Oh gosh. Uh, but uh, so on my walks, I I listen to Interstitial, and I'm and that's like a pretty long backlog. So I'm working through that. But I also listen to Taz. I listen to The Adventure Zone. Hmm. Um. And I think everyone does, but the new the new season Steeplechase is really really good. Um, it's a place in the dark campaign, um, and it sort of takes place in this kind of horrible 
cyber future Disneyland <laughs> where like everyone is sort of like in the immersive experience. It's mm. terrifying and it's very good. That sounds terrifying and extremely good. So I might be checking that one out myself. Um, so yes, uh, having discussed many things, uh, is there anything you want to bring up at this point in time? Um, I don't think so. I think that we've we've covered a lot. I'd say like the only the only other thing is like if if anyone out there listening has a story about something that is fucked up and they they want someone to tell that story, um, you can always email me and we we can try and work together. Uh, but that's it. Uh, I really want to continue to do journalism that serves the tabletop role playing game community, and I want to continue to do journalism that serves the gaming community, and I want to continue to do journalism that uplifts the the other journalists and like the games criticism and like games reporting colleague like my colleagues. You know, mm-hmm. I really want to help further the the respect that people have for games journalism um and i really want to tell people's stories and you have told many stories and we are uh, well i personally am looking forward to reading (laughs) more of of your stories both literal stories and the articles you write within uh the various fandoms that that we sort of share in that respect thank you Um, wait what are some of your fandoms what what fandoms do we share well Science fiction, TTRPGs, yes. movies, okay. and yes. uh, sci-fi, and a few other bits and pieces. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, okay. I was being general because there's we can yeah. go down rabbit holes, and, and we don't want to go down there. Fine, uh, you fine. don't want to go down rabbit holes. I'm fine to go down rabbit holes. Well, interesting, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I hope to deliver in the future. I hope to. I hope that like my articles make you happy. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> with the future in mind, as, as sort of the, as we sort of start closing this out, with the future in mind, where do you see the TTRPG hobby fandom, uh, just business in general? You you've seen everything and watched everything from pre wizards to now uh the uh sort of paizo coming into to sort of to the forefront along with indie companies the Mm -hmm. orc system being created and things like that where do you think the hobby Mm -hmm. is going into the future um gosh i still think it's really hard to say especially with we really don't know what's going to happen with one D &D, and i think the fact is that dungeons and dragons still has a massive advantage over everyone else in the industry even with the kerfuffle uh, of january so we'll have to see what one D does we'll have to see what some of the big creators do um i still think that critical role has some tricks up their sleeve and i think that they're going to yeah i think that if they if they do something different then D is really going to have to adjust fast um i I mean, personally, the the only thing that I can say is that I really think that the future of RPGs is going to be more diverse. Mm. I think that more voices, more companies, more games, I think that that's kind of the only guarantee that I have is that people are going to continue to make games and they're going to continually and deliberately move away from Dungeons and Dragons. I think that's the the only guarantee right now. Mm. All right. Well, we will watch together and hopefully um, sort of see some fantastic progress through across the board, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. Just going to keep that hope and alive. Yeah. Keep that alive. Uh, yeah, Linda's... I think I think on, we sorry. only need to look. Yeah, no, I'm sorry too. Uh, I think the only thing that we need to do is, or we can look at, you know, uh, Zine Quest and how incredible Zine Quest is every year and grows mm. every single year and has moved far beyond its origins at at Kickstarter to where like enti- like people are are basing their entire operating budgets on like fe- what they do in February, whether mm. that's on Kickstarter or Game Founder or Indiegogo. Um, so I think that I think that we just sort of have to look at the success of the that sort of indie 
RPG movement to see that it's possible and it's happening right now. But I, I hope that that continues and that more more indie games come out. Yeah, no, looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Uh, Linda, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And I know we've got a lot more topics to talk about. So I'd love to get you back in the future to see how the hobby develops, how your career develops, how your writing and, and all those sort of good things uh, develop. So so we as a uh, a group can follow you one last time would you like to repeat where we can find you on social media please yeah you can find me being a gremlin on twitter my twitter is lynn codega l-i-n-c-o-d-e-g-a uh i am a disaster and i'm very online excellent come hang out with me <laughs> <laughs> we sure will it's been a pleasure as i say i'd love to get you back in the future if you'd be willing to come back and join me absolutely thank you so much adam thank you linda Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the show, then go to www.snydersreturn.squarespace.com. Alternatively, you can find us over on Twitter, at Return Snyder. We have a link tree link in the description of this episode. And if you want to support us, come and join us over on Patreon, and we also have a Discord server. Uh, please leave us a review, because we'd love to learn how to improve the channel and provide better content out for, for those who are listening. Uh, until we uh, until we speak again thank you <laughs>